Hi everyone, welcome to the Reed Foundation's Technical Assistance Webinar for Fall 2020 Quality of Life Grants. Today's webinar will be hosted by Mark, the Director of our Quality of Life Grants Program. Just two quick notes before we start. If you click on the chat box located at the bottom of the webinar screen, you'll see the link for live captions for this webinar. You may click this link and open it in another browser to view today's captions. Additionally, please place any questions you may have in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screens. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Hi, Mark. Hey, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, as Kaylee mentioned, I'm Mark Bogosian. I'm the director of the Quality of Life Grants Program here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, and I want to welcome all of you to the Reeve Foundation Quality of Life uh, Applicant Technical Assistance Webinar. Um, and but before I begin, I really I want to thank um, Julie Lebinsky and Kaylee Kaylee Eslanian, and um, they are doing all of the behind the scenes technical work. So um, we're in their hands, and they're doing a great job. And I also want to thank Lexi Gleason, who is part of the QOL team, the Quality of Life Grants team, and she's going to be responding to your questions that you post uh, throughout the webinar. Now, if she doesn't get to one of your questions or misses it. Um, we'll, we'll try to get to it at the end during the Q&A period. So please, um, as Kaylee said, type in your questions into the question and answer box um, and not the chat box, just, you know, um, but if you do put it in the chat box by accident, we'll, we'll still also get to it, but it just helps us, um, you know, have everything in one place and it's easier to respond to. Um, after the webinar, if you have questions, um, we welcome you to submit questions throughout the application process um, or you know, about the application process to QOL at ChristopherReed.org. And actually, I have that here. Ah, there it is. Okay, QOL at ChristopherReed.org. And so this email um, is where you can submit um, all of your questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect the questions from QOL, collect questions that are posted here in the chat box and um, the Q&A box, and we'll aggregate them and answer them and put them into an FAQ um, that's gonna be posted on our website. Um, we do ask though that the, you know, the, the deadline for these email questions is next Monday, September 21st. Um, that way we can get everything up on board so folks have a chance to uh, see all the answers. All right, so. The 2020 second cycle um, of the Quality of Life Grants Program offers both direct effect and high impact priority grants. Um, the deadline for these submissions is October 22nd, and all grants must be completed within 12 months of receipt of the award funds, and they are non-renewable. Um, grants awarded through this cycle are going to begin on January 1st, 2021 and they will close on December 31st, 2021. Um, and I, we, you know, we state these, this um, on our website and also in our uh, guidelines, but you know, the foundation unfortunately is no longer able to respond to individual pre-award assistance, um, either by telephone or email, but we are able to discuss some of the you know, technical issues that you're facing or you know, very common grant questions as we're doing now and post those in the FAQ. So please um, you know, get those after this to qol at christopherreed.org. And what I really wanna focus on in this webinar though is, because um, a lot of this is um, already in the program and application guidelines. So that information I'm gonna kind of move through really quickly. And I wanna focus on the funding restrictions, um, eligibility, and some information on budget specifics. Because we see a lot of times where folks struggle with the, um, the budget and the budget template. So I wanna talk about that. Um, we've also added this year to, you know, for this cycle actually, to the, um, guidelines is uh, scoring rubrics and a copy of the application review form that the external reviewers use when they're reviewing and scoring your applications. And this is going to allow you guys to better understand how your applications are evaluated um, and um, 
as I said, they're in the guidelines, but they are also posted on our website. And I really can't encourage you enough to take a look at them, um, just to really get a get an understanding of of how we do this. Um, um, and I can't. Um, Oh, I just also want to say also included in the guidelines because we, we also added this year um, samples of the interim and final reports um, because a lot of you have asked um, or, or said that it would be really helpful to see what those um, entail. So um, I said that we will talk about um, how the grants are selected, but we will talk about that a little more in detail. But there is a new page on our website that, that goes into detail about the whole review process, but I will touch on that a little bit as we go down in some further slides. So here is our overview for what we're gonna accomplish in the next hour. And as I said, I'm gonna be talking really fast over some of these things because they're in the guidelines. And then some of these I will, um, you know, slow down a bit and, and address. So we have an introduction to the National Paralysis Resource Center and the grants program. We're gonna go over eligibility, funding restrictions, allowable expenses. We'll do both program descriptions. And then um, what I always find helpful is accessing the grants portal, the whole application process. And then we talk about the review process and how the grants are selected. And then finally, at the end, we're just gonna to touch on um, how awards are, how you're notified, and then some of the requirements, just so you have that already in your mind as to what needs to be done. So I just want to give you a, a really quick brief history of the foundation. So the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation's roots stretch back to 1982, when a New Jersey high school student, Henry Stifel, was involved in a car accident and left him paralyzed at the age of 17. And what started as the Community Stifle Paralysis Research Foundation soon became the American Paralysis Association, or the APA. And then in 1995, when the actor Christopher Reeve was injured, the APA was one of the first places that he and his wife Dana uh, turned to. So by 1999, the APA actually became the Christopher Reeve Foundation, and then Dana's name was added after her untimely passing in 2006. Um, what's important to know about the foundation is that we are par paralysis focused and that the grant funding must be targeted to projects that will serve individuals living with paralysis as well as their families and caregivers. So we use a functional definition of paralysis, which is um, difficulty and or inability to use arms or legs due to neurological conditions. And this includes, but is not limited to, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, ALS, uh, post-polio post syndrome, and, um, you know, and others. So, while we will consider supporting programs that include people that have other types of disabilities, but you know we're really talking about cross disabilities here, as well as um, inclusive community projects, the projects must serve a majority of people with paralysis. So um, just uh, you know, something to really keep in mind that it's really focused on paralysis and serving the majority of people living with paralysis. So the Christopher and Dana Reeve National Paralysis Resource Center has been federally funded since 2014 um, through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration, um, Human and Health Services, uh, which is the Administration for Community Living, ACL. Um, and you'll hear me mention ACL a lot through this. Um, the National PRC provides deeply needed information, programs, and individualized support and assistance to the over 5.3 million Americans that are living with paralysis. Um, the foundation of the National PRC are our information specialists, and they are the folks who have provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to over 100,000 families in 170 languages. So these are the folks that you email, that you call, that give you all types of information, and that are there 
at any time to be able to respond and answer your questions and help. Um, we also have a military and veterans program, which supports the unique needs of our servicemen and women. There's a peer and family support program with over 440 certified peer mentors, and they pr provided over 12,000 people with support and mentorship. Um, there is a virtual community that we have with over 3 million users who they, you know, visit our website, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media outlets. Um, there's Reef Connect, which is a private forum for our community. And I invite all of you to sign up and add your voice and share your expertise. So to do that, please go to our website at www.christopherreeve.org and you'll see that um, uh, web address later on also. So the quality of life grants are also funded through our cooperative agreement with ACL. Um, and I just wanna add that um, as of our last cycle, we have funded over $30 million to over 3,200 programs. And that is since our inception in 1999. So, um, Lastly, but I, I, what I do want to add too is that the, the National PRC offers free health related resources and materials. And on this slide, I'm just, just here's a quick view of really some of what we offer. And all of these uh, resources are free, including our flagship publication, the Paralysis Resource Guide. Um, we have wallet cards on sepsis, deep vein thrombosis, and other secondary conditions. Um, there are many publications on issues such as bladder and bowel management, or pressure injuries, or advocating for the rights of children who are living with paralysis. There are state fact sheets and many other resources, and we really please, we, we invite all of you to reach out to us at any time for these materials, either for your own organizations or, you know, for the people that you serve. So the Quality of Life Grants Program, this is really what the, the you know, the main thing that we have our grants program and we impact and empower people living with paralysis um, as well as their families and caregivers by providing grants to nonprofit organizations whose projects and initiatives foster inclusion, involvement, and community engagement, all while promoting health and wellness for those affected by paralysis in all 50 states and the US territories. So before you start your application, we really do recommend that you read the application and program guidelines. Um, that provides information about the QOL grants programs, um, program and funding for the different tier descriptions, new eligibility criteria, um, funding restrictions, allowable expenses, as well as we share the um, application questions. Um, and the guidelines are all available on our website. Um, we also ask you to visit our website uh, for an overview of the QOL grants program and for the QOL grant application process, which are each their own web pages. Um, and we ask that you do please read all of this information um, contained in the documents and on the web page to familiarize yourself with the application process and to better understand, um, you know, or, or actually to better prepare um, the required information that are requested in the applications. Um, also on this um, slide, it'll, it, it shows you that we also have available on our website, the People First Language Guide, which are guidelines for discussing people with disabilities. Um, and there's also a quick guide to establishing evaluation indicators. Now the grant application requires you to describe evaluation indicators that you're going to use to measure the success of your project. So the indicators must be a combination of both input and output indicators, and they must be measurable. Um, you're also going to be asked to describe evaluation methods that you use, um, and it could be anything, you know, surveys, interviews, focus groups, or uh, a review of the program documents. 
our timeline. So just very quickly, we opened last week. Today is our uh, technical assistance webinar. The deadline for questions, as I said, is next Monday, the 21st, and that's to QOL at ChristopherReeve.org. Proposals are due the 22nd of October at 11.59 p.m. Uh, our uh, uh, software, our grants, uh, online grants program, uh, turns off at that time at 11.59 that evening, and you will not be allowed to submit after that. Um, there's an, an external review process that goes uh, for the month, you know, from October through November, and then an internal review process um, you would be notified by uh, the end of December if, you know, either way, whether the grant has been approved or the application has been approved or declined. And the grant period, as I mentioned earlier, runs from January to December of 2021. So applications are accepted from nonprofit organizations, municipal and state governments, school districts, uh, recognized tribal entities and other institutions such as community or veterans hospitals. And here's the really important part. So you must be a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, fiscal sponsors are not allowed to apply on behalf of 501c3 organizations. Um, prior grantees are encouraged to apply for new and innovative projects. However, um, funding requests for continuation of projects from, you know, these uh, direct effect and high impact priority grants, um, they will be considered based on merit and success of a uh, past grant program, you know, so we, we're not expecting you to um, come up with some new and innovative nursing home transition program when that has worked very well and is something that is evidence-based and tried and true. So, um, however, if it is a continuation or, you know, something similar to what had been funded in the past, you know, we will consider it, but we really do encourage new and innovative projects. Um, also, organizations that have been previously awarded uh, quality of life grant in any category in the past, um, you may apply for funding one year following the close of your grant and also notification of the grant being closed by the Reed Foundation. So once the grant is closed, we will send out an, you know, an email notification saying, you know, thank you very much. The grant has been closed. And we also have a lot of communication in between all of that. So um, I just want to quickly talk about multiple submissions. Um, multiple submissions are not considered. Um, your organization may apply for only one grant in a grant cycle and only under one tier. However, the it, and it's not an exception, but more than one chapter of a national organization can apply um, in the same grant cycle. And we often see that a lot. So that is eligible. Um, looking at funding restrictions, so this is really in accordance with our federal cooperative agreement. So um, the Reef Foundation is prohibited from funding in the following. So grants uh, awarded directly to individuals, um, and this is really kind of a, a, a point that I really want you all to, to hopefully understand. So anything that is seen um, as a gift to an individual would also be considered a grant to an individual. So what, like, what does that mean? And that means things like um, a ready bag for a disaster preparedness grant or t-shirts for a summer camp or jerseys and uniforms for a wheelchair basketball team. And so, or, or a home modification. So anything that, is, has the appearance of being a gift to an individual is also looked at as a part of a grant being directly awarded to individuals and we're not able to do that, nor are any of the funds able to go from you directly to individuals. Um, and later on, we'll talk a little bit, uh, of course, about the difference between a home modification and a um, facility modification, um, you know, which of course would be uh, electronic doors for a community center or something like that. 
Um, we are also not, um, I'm, I feel like I'm missing a slide here. Oh, here, it, it's here. Um, so funding, so for non, um, the for-profit companies, um, and this also includes nonprofit organizations that are acting as a fiscal sponsor for a for-profit company or another organization that does not have its own 501c3 tax determination status. Um, we also are not allowed to um, fund organizations and projects that are based outside of the United States uh, because these are federal funds um, and also product projects that utilize contractors or vendors that are outside of the U.S. The two big areas that we are also not able to fund is research under any circumstance or rehabilitative therapy. But I want to talk a little bit about this and you'll, there's also some uh, information about this in the guidelines, but a, a program though that uh, helps uh, people living with paralysis to participate in exercise opportunities, those are allowable. So let me kind of try to break those out a little bit for you guys. So programs that use a physical or occupational therapy therapists that are going to be working directly with people with paralysis is considered a part of rehabilitative therapy. So the opposite would be exercise opportunities that are facilitated by someone who, for example, has a bachelor's degree in exercise science or is a certified fitness instructor, that would be an allowable expense. Equipment. So this, um, I'm also, there's going to be uh, three slides or so here just really talking about equipment. So equipment is uh, restricted. However, there are some instances where we can fund equipment. And one is if the equipment is being made available through a loan closet. Otherwise, um, the equipment provided to individuals to keep would be considered a gift, which we talked about a little bit earlier. So um, requests for loan closets must include a specific period of time. Um, a device loan is typically four to six weeks and sometimes can be up to nine weeks or three months. Um, and this enables individuals to try out and familiarize themselves with, let's say, the piece of equipment, assistive technology, or durable medical equipment before they acquire it on their own but the organization has to have something in place so that it does function as a, like a, like a lending library or a loan closet. Um, Open-ended or long-term loan closets will not be considered. And this also applies to something like ramps. So a ramp um, may be part of a loan closet that is lended out for a very specific period of time and then brought back and provided to other users. Also, a way to um, where we can where we can fund equipment is if it provides access and or promotes independence. So providing access um, would be things like adaptive strollers that are used as part of a program and that are not given out to individuals or re and, and that they remain on site. Um, a transfer chair at a community pool a stair lift, um, or an examination table at um, in a rural area where no such equipment is available um, in that region. So that type of equipment is allowable because it provides access. Um, if it if it, a piece of equipment is promoting independence, that would be let's say a scale, like um, because knowing your weight promotes independence, it allows people to remain healthy. Um, as being overweight can lead to a myriad of chronic health conditions. Um, let's say beach wheelchairs or adaptive bikes in a community park or you know a sports wheelchair for a community sports team. Um, even though all of those could also fit under providing access, it also promotes independence. Um, one thing, you know, I just, one thing I do want to say about that in, in terms of, um, so gym equipment that is providing access, as, as we just talked about. However, not gym equipment 
that would have to have a physical therapist on hand or a medical type personnel guiding you through the process that would be used in therapy, that would not be considered um, because it would also be considered part of that whole therapy, um, rehabilitative therapy piece. Um, here's the one caveat to all of this though, equipment may be purchased under the nursing home transition grants. And when we talk about the nursing home transition grants, um, I will talk about that. So if you have questions and all, I unfortunately can't see them. So I don't know if you're typing them in. Um, I do see the button over here that says like 19. So if Lexi's getting to them, that's great. And if not, we'll, you know, get on to them at, by the end. Um, so another uh, two other things that are not allowable through our cooperative agreement would be the development of prototypes for invention of equipment or anything that involves intellectual property rights and construction. So I want to talk about this because funds can support really, you know, simple accessibility modifications of existing structures, you know, existing structures or playgrounds or trails. So for example, like requested funds for a simple accessible bathroom modifications, that's allowable if you are um, modifying an already existing bathroom. So it, it, you can't be adding a new bathroom to the building. Um, allowable expenses would include things like a grab bar, um, accessible toilets and sinks. But as I said, we can't fund the building of a new bathroom or any major renovation of the existing bathroom. You know, we can widen things, we can widen the door, but again, um, there's a very big difference between construction and um, the simple accessibility modifications. Um, and just, you know, this has come up a few times. So if, um, if let's say you're requesting funds for an accessible lift or an elevator, this would be allowable under equipment that provides access and promotes independence. However, what we couldn't fund would be the excavation or construction of the elevator or shaft that would be considered major construction. So elevators and lifts are generally simple, you know, plug-in devices that help people get up a few stairs or from one floor to another. And so that is not major construction. But again, let's say the excavation or the construction of an elevator shaft, that would be considered major construction. Um, there's a bunch of other things here. They're all listed in your guidelines. Um, lobbying, of course, being very, very important. Um, you know, anything that would, you know, work to influence legislation, um, meals, food, water, uh, medical services, all of those are also um, restricted. So just to quickly touch on allowable expenses, and we'll kind of see that, you know, when we uh, look at some of the programs, you'll see the more of a wide range of programmatic expenses that these allow um, and the services that they allow. And we, you know, we'll see those in both the direct effect and high impact priority descriptions. Um, grant funds in general can, can support, you know, programmatic personnel, um, consultants and contracted workers, entry fees, transportation costs, uh, facility rental, uh, travel reimbursement, marketing equipment if it falls under those you know it areas that we just talked about um and supplies and later we'll be going through the um the the template the budget template just so you can take a look and see what that looks like um we have the same we we pass on the same guidelines that we adhere to with our federal cooperative agreement and that is airfare is capped at 500 dollars for a trip uh, train it is at 275, hotel at 225 per night, and mileage is at 57.5 cents per mile. Um, other, as I, as I mentioned, the allowable expenses are the equipment and supplies. And this is really something to, to 
you know, to take to heart that um, program expenses directly related to serving individuals with paralysis and their families are considered more favorable than operational expenses and or large capital projects. So, and here, I, I, th this is something that, you know, we, we always end up um, really needing to address. So this is something that is really not as, as much in the guidelines, but I want to really focus on this. And it's, please be specific in your funding requests. Um, so for example, if you're requesting funds for equipment for a loan closet, be specific in the proposed budget line indicating the pieces of equipment. And we'll go through this you know, a little bit later on down the line, but here's an example. So let's say you're asking for four eye gaze devices at $4,000 per device for a total of $16,000. We need to see that kind of specificity. Or if you're talking about a part of the process, so let's say there's travel and you're asking for a travel amount, what we need to see is that this is going to be four trips to a demo center, which is 532 miles away um, at 57.5 cents per mile for a total of $306. So what we're really trying to encourage is please do not request just a blanket $25,000 for equipment in the budget line. And you know we see that a lot with playgrounds where it'll say playground equipment, $25,000. We need to understand what the pieces of equipment are so that we can also see if they are really pieces of equipment that are going to serve our population. Um, and also we are then able to, um, you know, we share all of this information with ACL um, so that they know what types of uh, equipment are being funded and that, you know, what the usage is for. Um, we also ask you to please include vendor quotes for these specific budget line items. Um, so vendor quotes must be current at the time of the application submission. We receive some that are a year old or, you know, however many years old. Um, please just make sure that they are within three months of the, you know, you are asking for them now. Um, and they are within this time period. Um, so again, they're strongly recommended for equipment, services, and contractors. So here's where I'm gonna just touch on nursing home uh, transition. So, and I'm, I'm gonna read this and I hate reading from a slide, but um, quickly put on my glasses. So awards, they can be used to address barriers to facilitating successful nursing home transition for individuals with paralysis. Now this can include startup costs, let's say housing deposits or equipment, which could be a medical device, AT, uh, assistive technology, Hoyer lifts uh, or any kind of adaptive equipment. It also can include supplies which could be any kind of general home furnishing, like a stove or a washer and dryer. So you're someone living with paralysis, you are moving out of a nursing home into your own independent living situation and you're not able to access the stove because the buttons are on the on top. So this gives you, you know, a stove where the buttons are accessible. So those types of things and you know what other things that are listed here and in the guidelines just so that I, I specifically wanted to mention that because that is the one place under our nursing home transition program where in um equipment can go to an individual because it's a part of the program that has been approved by acl So the direct effect quality of life grants uh, tier one is open focused and we're going to award at least 36 grants of up to $25,000. So I think I'm going to talk about this somewhere in another slide, but I want to mention it here. For the direct effect grants, there are times we get up to 375 applications in a cycle. Um, we can award up to, let's say, 54 
you know, anywhere between 30 to, you know, 60 have been awarded in the past. So just, you know, really keep that in mind. But if everybody were coming in with a $25,000 proposal, you know, we would be able to award up to 36. Um, and, you know, these grant funds fund, you know, specific budget items that clearly impact the lives of people living with paralysis, as well as their families and caregivers. Um, so these are short term, medium range impact, you know, we're not expecting these to be long term impact. And, you know, sustainability is really not expected at this level. Um, high impact quality, uh, high impact priority, the quality of life grants, um, I'm going to describe those more in depth. But as you can see, there are three tiers within here for transportation, respite, caregiving and disaster response, nursing home transition and employment. And I'm going to go into those in depth. Um, expanded effect, um, expanded, we, we've actually renamed that to expanded impact. Um, those are awarded in the spring and those are uh, up to $100,000 for previously awarded um, grantees that have shown um, demonstrable and successful impact. So here's just a list of types of projects that we fund. Um, and really, you, you have the list here, but again, arts. Uh, assistive technology, adaptive sports, uh, service animal programs. It, it, it really is pretty wide and open. Um, we, looking at the types of projects that are funded, you know, it, it could be anything from sports wheelchairs for a wheelchair basketball team, um, a hydraulic lift at a pool, electronic door openers at the community center, but it can also be, uh, you know, something very specific like a workshop, um, an education series on sex and sexuality with spinal cord, or um, a program for preventing abuse and adaptive sports. So all of those types of really wide ranging programs are allowable through the direct effect tier. Um, high priority. So here, I'm going to talk about each of these individually. So in this tier two, these are the grants that are up to $30,000. So transportation, these grant funds support um, organizations that and, and programs that provide accessible transportation to people living with paralysis to access services in their community. In addition, funds may support adaptive driving education programs to enable people that are living with uh, paralysis to either learn to drive or learn to drive again. Um, there's respite caregiving. Now this grant area here, it recognizes family caregivers and the vital role that they play in caring for those with paralysis. So fund support um, nonprofit organizations that offer exemplary and innovative respite care services that are evidence-based and they appear promising and or are trying new service models. So I it, this is listed in your um, guidelines, but I just want to quickly go through the, the types of forms that are supported, the, uh, the types of uh, respite um, that is supported through this grant. So there's emergency respite, home-based services, uh, sitter companion services, um, consumer directed respite, out of home respite, um, family care homes or host family and respite center based. Um, there's adult day healthcare services and also parent family cooperatives. Grant funds that uh, cannot be used to support um, corporate foster home settings for children and teens or residential facilities or the respitality model, um, home-based hospice or camps. Um, Again, all of that information is in the guidelines, so you're, you know, please go take a look at that as well. Um, disaster preparedness. Now, these grant funds support organizations and programs that address emergency preparedness. Um, 
They address the needs of people living with paralysis in a natural disaster environment. However, lately we've had some groups that have come to us and have been awarded and have focused on things such as um, uh, you know, the power outages in LA or, or, or California when you know, they're, uh, you know, they're trying to uh, contain various uh, things that are happening such as the, you know, the wildfires or so, um, or something disaster preparedness, uh, something that somebody was recently awarded for was um, active shooter training, you know, something that people are not thinking about and need to think about how do we serve our community in those types of situations. Um, nursing home transition, this is tier three and these are grants up to $40,000. And so this group of grants fund um, Centers for Independent Living, the SILS, um, and other organizations as well, but that provide transition services across the country to transition people with paralysis that are living in a nursing home back into their homes or into a community-based setting of their choice. Um, this also um, funds, um, and, and right now, of course, the word is escaping me, uh, and it, it's where, you know, where it's the, the funds can be used to keep people from entering a nursing home as well. Lastly, our tier four is um, employment, and these are grants that are up to $50,000. Now, the um, these grants are one of our top priorities because employment is fundamental in achieving and maintaining independence. And it's still also one of the most challenging obstacles to people living with paralysis. So in addition to gainful employment that allows people with uh, paralysis to achieve enhanced financial security, um, it, it enables them to have higher quality of life and improved community connections. So the grant funds for this program um, are gonna support programs that assist individuals living with paralysis to enter or re-enter or remain or advance in the workplace. Um, they're gonna create career pathways to meaningful living wage jobs. Um, they're gonna provide job development services to people that are living with paralysis and that can include um, career education, adaptive technology and career training, all with the goal of finding gainful employment. Um, one thing to note here is that grant funds may not support stipends or funds may not be given directly to workers or program participants as salaries or other incentives, because again, that goes into the whole gifts to individuals, grants to individuals. So I see we're coming um, up on time at uh, about 20 minutes or, or so. Um, let's talk about accessing the online grants portal. Now, a lot of this is in the, um, in the application guidelines. So just, you know, once you, um, you uh, have a chance to look at all of that, all of this will be in here. But what we do ask is that you please do add the QOL at ChristopherReeve.org and the administrator at grantinterface.com. Add those um, addresses to your uh, acceptable email addresses so that it's not blocked by spam. The administrator um, at grantinterface.com, those are the emails that are going to be coming to you directly from our online grant system. So, um, and you know, that here is also the link. So the link to accessing it is both on our website and in the guidelines. And there are, as I said, um, it, or I, ha I actually haven't said, but if you, um, when these slides are up, you can also copy and paste this um, URL and get onto our online grants portal. Um, after clicking on, uh, on the link, you're gonna be brought to the foundation site, the logon page. Now, if this is the first time you're applying for a grant, you're gonna need to create a new account. 
So just you click on the new account button and you're gonna be asked to input contact information and information about your organization, um, thus creating a kind of a grantee profile. Um, if you need assistance, uh, there's a link to an a registration tutorial video on the portal page, or you can always just email us here at qol at christopherreed.org. Um, I just quickly need to say this though, if you've applied in the past and you're, you need to enter your email address and password that you've already used, because if you've forgotten your password, just click on the, there's a button down there that says forgot your password link and an email will be sent to you with your password. And if you don't remember or have access to the email address, just contact us at qol at christopherreed.org and we will help you out with that. But it's really, really important um, that you enter an email address and a password that are already connected to your organization's account. Um, so please do not duplicate um, an organizational profile, meaning create a brand new one, um, because all of the application history and everything historical is connected to that previous version. Um, and please, while you're in there, please be sure to update um, your organization and contact profiles um, that are in the online system um, with you know, people that are current and that are able to receive the uh, communications from us. Um, once you've applied, um, once you've created the new account, you're gonna be brought to the apply page. And if, as you can see here, um, you just click on that blue apply button. And again, all of this is in the uh, application guidelines. Um, you're going to then be brought to the application itself. If you want to print out the questions in advance, there's a button up here, the question button, the question list button that's in the upper right hand corner. A Word document will be downloaded and these um, applications, uh, the questions are also available in the guidelines. Um, the list of questions includes paragraph counts and limits for the text fields. And the majority of folks like to um, kind of do this in Word first and then upload it into the online system. It uh, just, they feel that it's much more helpful to do it that way. Um, as you can see here, the application is broken down into um, organizational information, um, proposal summary, proposal description, budget information, and then there's an area for supporting documents. Very quickly, um, this is an example of, you know, some of the questions that you're going to need to ask. Um, note that the character limits, um, some say 3,000 characters, that's about one page of a Word document. So if there's a 10,000 character limit, that would be about three pages. Now we do not require you to use all of those characters, um, but the system just won't let you go over that. Um, very quickly, and I'm gonna go into this a little more, this is what the budget template looks like, and you type into the budget line, you type in the total cost of the budget line and the requested amount, the subtotal and the total costs are gonna formulate for you automatically. Our budget areas are personnel costs, equipment, uh, consultants and contracts, supplies, travel, and other costs. Now, at the very bottom of all of this, a subtotal section appears and it's gonna formulate for you. Um, and the totals are gonna to mirror what is shown in the above budget. Um, we also ask that you include other sources of funding and please note if the funding is committed or pending. And here on this next slide is kind of an example. So here you see the overall budget is $465,000. Um, they've broken out the personnel by, you know, full time. One person is at 12.5, another person is at 25%. Sometimes the total costs may not be the, the amount requested, um, and you would explain that in your budget narrative, which I'll talk about also a little bit. Um, so you'll see that there can be differences in total costs, but we do need to see what the total costs are as opposed to the amounts that you are requesting. So earlier on, I talked a little bit about 
um, equipment. And I said, you know, please just don't give a $25,000 uh, playground equipment. So here's an example where you would say, um, you know, a 33 foot sky run zip track in, you know, number 90856. And the vendor quote would also show what that specifically is. In this example, you know, it, you're, you're showing that it's $15,000, but you're only asking for $750. Explain why or, you know, explain what it's going to be used for. Say, you know, here's where a merry-go-round, you know, you're asking for the full amount. Um, you know, and it, again, a vendor quote is helpful and in the budget narrative, you know, to explain why the merry-go-round is um, helpful and uh, would be of service to people living with paralysis. Um, you'll see there's an area for indirect costs, which we can talk about in the budget narrative section. And here's where I talked a little bit about if, you know, if the funding is committed, if it's pending. So earlier we saw that this was a $465,000 budget. Here, you're showing that there's 437,000 that's pretty much all committed. There's, you know, a chunk of it that's pending. Our funds would probably bring it up to the 465. So what we would be doing in looking at that is saying, you know what, I mean, this is an organization that we know that they pretty much have the funding in place. This is something that, you know, where we would not be as concerned as if, you know, there was $350,000 that was pending or not even pending. So, you know, we want to be able to see the full budget and where the refunds would fit into that budget. Um, as I mentioned, there is a budget narrative and we ask you to, you know, fill that out. Um, the budget narrative must include a description and justification of each of the budget categories um, that are in the line item budget. Um, and the budget narrative should really help us get a better understanding of what the grant funds are being used for. So please do that. And you'll see, I did say that I would talk about this just in terms of administrative costs. There is a de minimis indirect cost rate of no more than 10%. That's allowable. However, if your organization does have a negotiated federal uh, indirect cost rate agreement with uh, NICRA, um, you can include indirect costs at the federally negotiated rate, but you're gonna have to provide us with your current fund um, NICRA uh, document to, to show us that it, um, that's what the rate is. So once um, you're working on the application, it can be saved at any time and you just keep going back to um, save application. And then once you've completed it, just hit the submit button. Um, you're gonna receive a confirmation page that'll pop up, but you're also gonna get an email. And that email is from that um, administrator at grantinterface.com. So please make sure that that um, email is accepted into your system. Um, I'm just looking at the time, but I did say that I really want to talk about the uh, review process because I just think that it's so important for us to be transparent with all of you. Um, so we rely on um, expert external reviewers who are experts in the field of paralysis. Now, they're both um, people that are living with paralysis as well as those that are not living with paralysis. Um, current and past reviewers have included doctors in both um, medical and mental behavioral health fields, um, lawyers, advocates, um, experts in areas such as assistive technology um, or other related fields. Um, it, caregivers and other stakeholders that are vested in improving the lives of people living with paralysis. So the aim of this external review is to really obtain peer and expert feedback on the proposed applications. Um, the external reviewers, um, they, they read, they evaluate, and they rate the application. Um, they identify the strengths and the weaknesses, and they, prov they provide feedback um, to us on various aspects of the application in areas such as like um, the project design or project reach or the evaluation aspect of it. Um, and they also look at organizational capacity. Can the organization carry this out? What then happens is, um, as I said, they look at, sorry, I'm like just 
just trying to go through my notes on this one. So we also have a web page that is um, now up on our website that describes this. Um, so the reviewers are provided as well with um, educational criteria and information, um, as well as um, a scoring rubric, which you now have access to in a scoring form. So they score and comment and the scores are compiled and they also recommend a grant or, you know, to be funded or not funded. So if the grant is recommended to be funded, um, we then take the applications that are scored high um, and that's generally about 80% and above. Um, and those are then sent to an internal review committee. So the internal review committee consists of foundation board members um, and foundation staff that are not associated with the Quality of Life Grants Program. They review the top applications and they score and rank them. And then they are discussed and evaluated at an internal review committee meeting. And then the internal review committee chooses the grants based on, again, the external reviewers' uh, comments and reviews, as well as their own ranking and evaluation. Um, this information here is, again, all noted in the um, guidelines, but you certainly will receive um, notification of either being awarded or, or not. Um, if you are, there are uh, some requirements that we just want you to be aware of, and one is a six-month interim report, and that just kind of lets us know that the project is proceeding as planned, or if it's not, and if it's not, you know, what can, you know, we, we'll, you know, talk with you, and we hope that we are, you know, we really do hope that we are in contact with you throughout all of these, you know, processes in, in year, uh, the, you know, throughout the year, through these months as well. And, you know, so, you know, then we can talk about like, you know, what we can do to help you get back on track. Um, we also require a final report that's due a month after the grant closes. And that really details the, again, the, the, the progress, the challenges that you faced, how the challenges were addressed, um, the project's impact. And that's where a lot of the impact and evaluation comes into hand as well as the expenditures. Um, we also do site visits. There's an evaluation that is um, asked to be completed and that is through Vanderbilt University. Um, and it just really allows you the opportunity to offer very candid feedback on what the experience was uh, for the whole grant process. Um, closing out your grant, you know, you can read a little bit more about that, but it's just, you know, clo uh, submitting your, your final report on time, um, expending the budget if fully, um, you know, it, addressing any of the issues that, that had um, occurred. Um, and then after it's closed out, you'll receive um, information from us, you know, recognizing that the grant has been closed and that you're then eligible to reapply. Um, there are times when a grant uh, will be terminated or, um, and you know, again, I do detail that in the, um, in the guidelines. So please take a look at those because I do want us to have time for some question and answers. Um, and I kind of mentioned this earlier on, but you know, in adherence with our federal cooperative agreement, you know, we're unable to comment on denied applications or provide programmatic direction to organizations that are applying. So that's why we, we really do urge you to submit your questions here and or um, you know, through QOL at ChristopherReed.org. And here we are on our last slide before we open it up to question and answers. And oh, wait a minute, I just wanted to have my information up there for all of you. Um, again, thank you so much for your interest in our grants program. I really look forward to receiving your submissions. Um, and again, questions, please send them to QOL at ChristopherReed.org. Um, I'm gonna turn off this slide thing so I can see if I can, um, go to the question and answers and try to take a look and see where we are and see if um, 
you know, there looks like there's a lot. So we're probably not going to have a chance to get through them. Um, okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to try to read them in, in order if, if I can. And again, all of these will be gathered and will be responded to. So after reading through the application, it states that detailed item costs are preferred over generic estimates of cost. Yes. Um, but how do we handle the pricing of items such as horses when the horses available today will not be the horses available in 2021 So the prices uh, and whom we source from them will change? Right. So, you know, in, in a situation like that, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, to the best of the ability. And, and, you know, we can certainly, if a grant were to be awarded, we would be able to, at that time, look at what it was and make potentially any necessary uh, budgetary changes. Um, you know, if let's say there were funds being asked also for personnel or something, we could try to shift those around. So, you know, in a situation like that, we certainly understand. Um, let me... So if the service provided to an individual is paid directly to a vendor, then it should not be considered as a gift. Is that a correct distinction? Yes. So the, the, the service is being provided to an individual, but it's through a vendor, let's say in a, for respite, right? The money is going to the folks doing the respite caregiving services. Um, the individual does benefit from it, but they are not receiving actual funds. Um, okay, so will other nonprofit entities that do not hold 501c3 status be considered for funding? We are applying, planning to apply as part of a state university. Um, Somehow something just popped up in front of it and I can't read anymore. <laughs> um, let me see. Okay. Uh, we're planning on applying as part of a state university that recently changed tax status from a 501c3 to different nonprofit status. Um, you know what, I, I need, I would need to really think about that. I, you know, universities and, um, I mean, it, it doesn't sound as if it would be part of a municipality, but you know what, um, we, I, let me, let me look into that because I need to better understand that a little bit, sorry. Um, I understand that gifts for individuals aren't allowed, What would coverage of participation fees for a group of hand cyclists be allowable? Yes. So, because um, it, what it would be, it wouldn't be money going directly to the individuals. It would just be money that allows them to participate in either, you know, the program or, or their participation. Um, 30 year old elevator modernization upgrade allowable. It would depend on what it entails. Um, I, you know, my concern would be that that would be looked at as major um, construction and not, you know, something as simple as a, a lift or, um, yeah. It, you know, again, it would really, I, I would, I would really, you know, I guess that's one of those areas where I would have to say that it, it really sounds to me like that would be major construction. Um, let's see. Um, some of these were addressed because these are kind of earlier. Um, 
Is outdoor wheelchair prototype development? Um, so no, um, any type of uh, you know prototype or intellectual property would not um, would not be allowable. Um, if the wheelchair existed and it was something that was being uh, provided for a program, then it would. But any type of you know development like that would not be. Okay. Um, let me just take a look. Uh, so it's only about five minutes past. We, let's let's still take a few more minutes if you're all pos if you know you're still able to join us. Um, So would funding to support operational expenses for an ongoing therapeutic riding program for children and adults who are living with disabilities be considered? Um, yes. It, it goes on to say this is a long-standing program that always relies on grant and other funding support in addition to class registration fees um, to meet all operational expenses and has experienced significant drop in historic revenue streams because, absolutely, right, because of the limited enacted um, to ensure programs in compliance with COVID-19 public health guidelines. Um, thus, our funding would request would be to help offset operational expenses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, especially, uh, you know, therapeutic horseback riding programs. Again, um, you know, people see the word therapeutic and think, well, that would not be allowable, but it it's, you know, you're not working with um, occupational therapists or physical therapists. Um, riding instructors uh, offer very different services. Um, and also in this case, if you were looking to support um, programming, et cetera, that, that certainly would be a part of allowable expenses. Okay, oh, this is a very good question. Uh, does it have to be respite and caregiving or just a caregiver program? It, it, it can certainly be either and or both. So um, it, it does not need to be restricted to both respite and caregiving. It could certainly just be a caregiver program. Um, Mark just mentioned not funding salaries due to gifts, but I did see where programmatic salaries are acceptable. Working to fund a day camp, is that just high, the high impact that restricts salaries? No, so they're, they're actually two different things. So one would be where um, if you were an employment program, you would not be able to be giving uh, money that would be considered a salary to um, a participant in the employment program, but any of the other grants, uh, you know, such as program salaries, that is absolutely um, acceptable. Um, let me answer this one really quickly. Um, we are a public library, 501c3, and want to apply for assistance purchasing a lift and making bathroom handicapped accessible. We are a town of 3,500 and must serve individuals living with paralysis, although we don't have specific examples of who those people are. Um, and once we are fully handicapped accessible, we would probably be able to serve many more. Should we apply? Absolutely, yes. You know, what you can do is, um, you know, uh, the, you know, try to look out at, you know, what data does exist, reaching out to, you know, some groups that may have that type of information in your, not only in your town, but in your region, because as you said, once the, you know, the uh, library is accessible, um, you know, the, the numbers of people that are able to um, use, 
its services would certainly increase. So, you know, you, you I would suggest really looking at some data that goes even beyond your town and, you know, perhaps the region, there might not be other accessible libraries in the area too. So you could try to include that data, but absolutely, you, you certainly should apply. Um, If we apply for a program that includes travel for next spring of 2021, but COVID still has travel restrictions, will we lose the grant? No. So what we would do is we would work with you um, to address whatever needed to be addressed to keep the aim of the project. Um, you know, that happened a lot with grants that have been awarded um, through our last or, or you know, even previous cycle. Um, you know, that let's say they started in January of uh, 2020, things were going great. All of a sudden March came and as you can imagine, everything stopped. So what we did is we, you know, worked with those programs to, um, you know, redirect the, the funding to different areas within the, the program that would still keep the aim of the program. So you, you would not lose the grant. We would, we would work towards, um, making it happen and there's you know and in a situation like this you know we're we're all experiencing a pandemic where you know this is unprecedented so you know we would work with you also to extend you know we always say that you know these are 12 month grants however there are exceptions um so you would not lose the grant um, can employment funds be used for tutors, note takers, and or personal assistant hours? Uh, yes, they certainly could be because that would be part of personnel to run the program. Um, I want to just maybe take a few more minutes because um, I'm, I'm very aware that we're coming upon the 15 minute mark. Um, and I, I do want to thank all of you. Um, Some of, some of these questions are really good that um, you know we're going to need to respond to more fully because I just need to um, you know like think about like there's a question here that's you know how should rider share usage be described in the budget? We usually use those apps to help transport hand cycles to races or parks for training. Um, you know, so I would say that, you know, what you would do is discuss the number of people that do use the hand cycles or that attend or that, um, if, you know, if you're transporting people, if you're transporting the hand cycles, you know, the number of people served through this, um, and you can both look at um, the hand cycles that would be transported uh, or the, you know, the, again, the number of people that are a part of the whole event and how it affects them. Um, but I, I certainly would uh, provide a more in-depth answer on that. Um, Um, on an accessible playground, I have a design that has been put together by a company we are working with. Uh, first, it is preliminary. We expect to make changes when the designer is coming to the area later in late October. Can I submit the preliminary design and ask for a dollar amount to go towards the structure? Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, um, it would be helpful to note that, but provide as much detail as you can. Um, and then, um, you know, we would know that this, uh, you know, has the potential to change because it, it, it may not. Um, and again, it may, it may or may not, but again, it would be something for us to be able to look at and the external review committee, um, if we, if they are able to receive that after they would also be able to look at then, um, what the, you know, the final design would be, but, Again, if you're asking for a merry-go-round and you, you know, you're able to provide that type of information and the preliminary design has a merry-go-round and the final design has the merry-go-round there, you know, uh, but we, we understand that sometimes that does happen. Um, 
you know, donating staff time to the, a project, should we include that as support of the application, thinking this would... Um, you know, it does. It does help to, to see that you are, you know, doing in kind. Um, it, it, you know, it lets us know that the organization is also able and financially able to do such of, uh, you know, these types of uh, parts within the budget. Um, last question, because I see we're at 415, is do we get feedback notes from the review panel? And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we're unable to share any type of uh, documentation like that because um, it's then seen uh, as providing, um, let's say in the next go around, kind of a, you know, a, a, a leg up on, on the next go round. So unfortunately, we're not able to provide feedback on uh, any type of uh, application, whether it's you know, been declined or, or not. Um, so we're at 4.15 and I really want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, again, all of these questions are going to be captured and we will uh, put together a document, have those up on our website as soon as possible. Um, the deadline is uh, the 21st. And again, thank you all so much. Um, we really look forward to receiving your proposals and um, thank you.